All right. Patrick is going to have a reading for you. Please make him feel welcome. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick. Excuse me, I'm a little nervous. It's my first time speaking in front of these 12 step groups. You know what I'm saying? And uh, <clears throat> I guess the reason why I'm here tonight is because I want to say that I'm a recovering American. It's very hard for me to get up here and talk about this addiction because I've heard a lot of people say, I wish I had that problem. After all, what could be wrong about being an American, right? We've got the strongest military in the world, a great capitalist economy where anybody can make it big if they work hard, and freedom, most importantly, freedom. Lots of people around the world would kill to enjoy the things that I do. And I guess that's why I'm here. There are a lot of people that want to kill me. Most of the time, I don't think about it. Between my work and my girlfriend, rooting for my sports teams, go Yankees. I, <laughs> I barely have time to notice what's going on in the world around me. But every now and then, like when 9-11 happened, or this guy Nick Berg got killed this week, I had to stop and think, why would anyone do this to me and my country? The answers I came up with made me feel uncomfortable inside. I realized that all the things that I enjoy, a lot of them anyway, are that way because of a lot of pretty nasty things my government does around the world. It was hard for me to find these things out, but if you look hard enough, you can see them. I mean, my government has been doing some crazy shite behind my back. Things like selling drugs, destroying capitalism, training terrorist death squads, and supporting dictators who don't respect the freedom that we promote around the world. Most of this stuff is supposed to be illegal, yet I let my government get away with it anyway. Why? I guess when it comes down to it, I never really cared about anybody else in the world. After all, everyone wants to be like us. Everybody comes here. That means we're doing something right right? Maybe not. I realize now that most people come here because the standard of living is so high. But the reason it is so high is because our government works with the big corporations to rob all the other countries blind. We've been doing it that way for hundreds of years. That's the American way. Kill your way to the top, and then when you get there, you write a few songs and a few history books that tell you that all that killing and stealing you just did was a great thing. And it sounds even better if you can get God to bless it all. But breaking this addiction is going to be hard, man. Hard. It's hard to know what the right thing to do is. I can't get the truth from any of the news channels or the newspapers because the big corporations own all of them. And a lot of people have gotten killed for trying to tell the truth about things. I mean, there are big bucks to be made by telling lies and keeping quiet about things. But I'm here because I know I need to be here. I did a lot of thinking about what being an American means, and I realized that it means that I'm not supposed to trust any government whatsoever. That doesn't mean that I don't believe in government, but it does mean that I have to work hard to make sure that they are telling the truth. There's too much power, too much potential for hurt in my country and the world if I don't keep up with what my government does. I also realized that being an American is not about belonging to any particular country. It's about freedom, plain and simple. They, they could burn this country tomorrow, and sometimes I think that they might just do that. But if I were alive, I'd still be free. Freedom is a natural quality. It's not a bonus plan for some people in the world. So as an American, I'm supposed to be helping others to get free too. Not just in my country, but the whole world over but not just by force, by setting a good example and sharing what we have. Being American is supposed to be about being a good human. I mean, think about it. America is the place where Europeans and other peoples came to give up being Europeans and other people. Sure, we like to call ourselves Irish Americans, African Americans, Italian Americans, and all the rest, but deep down, those things are things that are just that the earlier immigrants were willing to give up if it meant a better life for themselves and their family. Many of them learned a whole new language and a whole new way of living just to make things better for themselves. 
They transcended their original culture to create a new one because the old one wasn't working. I, I think it's time for all peoples, especially Americans, to transcend our cultures once again. Why especially us? In order to create this culture, we had to take so much from so many people. I think we should set a precedent of giving something back to the world. We've been taken and taken for such a long time that the world is getting burned out by us. To me, it just seems like the thing a responsible human being would do right now. So I'm sorry, everybody. I haven't been a good human being. I'm going to be a good one from now on, though. If that means forgetting that I'm an American in order to help us all share in the goodness of this planet, then so be it. If we all just shared what we had, there'd be less of a reason to fight over anything. So I'm giving up my share of what I've been holding back from all of you. But you've got to be patient and forgive my other American friends who can't be here tonight or who just won't come. You see, for all our tough talk, most Americans are just a bunch of scared pussy, uh, cats. Uh, excuse my French. Pardon me, sorry. We talk like we're the best in the world, but my people are the most afraid. How do I know that? Because Americans can't face the truth about anything. If we faced up to the truth of what we were doing all these years, we'd be sorry, and we'd have to make up for it. In other words, we'd have to change. But most Americans don't want to give up their 401k plans that are supporting drug dealing corporations or companies that take advantage of uneducated workers around the world. We don't want to see the starvation we cause around the world on television, because that would mean we couldn't enjoy our TV shows. We don't want to read and do the homework about real issues, because that would mean we would have to think. Americans are pretty good at memorizing trivial stuff, but don't ask us to think too much. And how do I know that we're such a bunch of scared rabbits? Look how much we spend on the military. We don't spend that much to promote peace around the world, we spend that much to protect ourselves from all the angry people that we've been robbing. It's like they used to say in kindergarten, if you didn't do anything wrong, then who are you hiding from? What do you got to hide? This war on terrorism is not about protecting us from terrorism. It's about allowing us to use terrorism to keep people quiet when they scream about how unfair the world is. So thanks for being here and listening to me. I got to tell you, it feels kind of nice to just be in the room with a bunch of human beings. No labels, just people. But this is, just, this is a hard addiction to fight, man. Maybe if I bring someone along with me next time, it'll be easier on me, and it'll give you hope that things can change around here. I'm willing to try. What about you? Thank you. of this CD will be an interview with the creator of the Institute of Unlearning, Patrick Mooney. We will explore the origins of the Institute, the unlearning process, and its challenges, as well as what the future plans of the Institute are. With that being said, 
Let's get started. Why don't you begin by telling us where the inspiration for the Institute of Unlearning came from? Ooh, where they, that's sort of like, uh, it's like unpeeling an onion, you know, there's lots of layers to it. Um, I used to be a religion teacher in a Catholic high school and I was a devout Catholic for most of my life and I really enjoyed that part. But uh, sometime in the college or in the course of my teaching career, I began to be exposed to uh, ideas of a more spiritual nature rather than just a religious nature. And one of my key spiritual influences at, at the time where I got the inspiration for unlearning was a, a Jesuit priest named Anthony DeMello, who was uh, very popular in Catholic spirituality circles. And uh, Anthony DeMello was kind of a rogue. He was banned by the Catholic Church posthumously for a while. His books had gotten so popular after he died. Um, and many of his teachings attacked religion. Uh, and he, he pointed out religion as an obstacle to true spiritual truth rather than a, a help in most cases. And one of his key phrases was unlearn, is that most of the things that you do in life, uh, most of the things you've been taught rather, are blocks to your true nature, your true self. And if you can peel those away, um, you can discover a lot about yourself and the true nature of life and, and, and a whole mystery of other kinds of stuff. And so for me, he was the first person who really helped me to get what my religion was really all about, if it had a purpose. And that purpose was spirit is more important than any law, any creed, any belief that religion might say is essential to life. It's more about what is the spirit. And so that was unlearned. And so I kind of really dove into that. And as my spirituality kind of blossomed, more and more I began to realize that my religion was less and less important. And this was a kind of tough contradiction for me being a Catholic school religion teacher. I really enjoyed the spiritual component of, of teaching kids about spirit, which has primacy over all religions, and uh, the conflict of being paid to be a religious education teacher, you know, teaching all the rules and the doctrines, what you can do, what you can't do, the morality associated with that. And the two oftentimes don't get along. And uh, I'd have to spend a great deal of time teaching my kids about the differences between spirituality and religion. And it became apparent to my kids and myself through my life that spirituality was winning that battle. And so it was putting me in between a rock and a hard place. And um, I had gone to a retreat um, with Neil Donald Walsh, the author of the Conversations with God series, and I had explained that dilemma during the retreat is something I was seeking clarity on. And he said, well, why don't you start your own school? And I looked at him like uh, Moses must have looked at God, you know, the burning bush after being told, lead my people out of Egypt. I'm like, who am I? I'm just this little guy, a religion teacher in a Catholic high school. I had no start of school. I don't know the first thing about any of those things. I'm, I'm passionate about what I teach. And I'm sure of the messages that I that I do bring to the world when I do bring them out. But it, there's a big difference between having a message and then building a whole thing like a school around it, not just spirituality, but everything else that a school would have to be. So I kind of shrunk away from it, even though a lot of people were offering me lots of insights. Uh, Neil and his organization, the CWG.org, they were starting a whole bunch of uh, Heartlight schools, which were alternative schools. But I just didn't feel like that was my calling. But anyway, at the end of the retreat, I decided, bam, I am out of school at the end of the year. And during that year, just at the end of the year, it's kind of funny. Life kind of tests you, tests you in, that, in that way. Um, the school gave me everything that I could ever ask for. They gave me a lot of honors classes, gave me a chance to write my own course, gave me a whole bunch of academic freedom to explore not only uh, the spirituality concepts I was very excited in, but also the um, uh, anti-history uh, concepts that I was also stumbling onto at this time in my life. And, uh, and the kids were really responsive. I was a very popular teacher. It was a lot of fun. Um, but ultimately, I think what happened after September 11th really caused me to question what's going on, not just once again spiritually, but what's going on politically, socially, economically. And let's just say I just had a very, very big awakening on all of those levels. And I was very clear that I myself had a lot of unlearning to do. 
And it was very, very hard for me then to stand up there in front of these kids and say, this is the truth of the situation when I was becoming very clear more and more each day that what I was being paid to teach was not the truth of the situation. And so no matter what, you could try and fight that fight. Spiritually, it would lead for me to be living this double life, having to be um, something in public and then in private, not really believing in it. And I could not live that contradiction any longer. And so the message was very clear for me, time to get out. And so um, I knew that I had to write a book about this in some form or another. Uh, and the idea of the Institute of Unlearning just kind of came up along the way. Once the book was finished, um, it had a whole lot of purposes. Not all of them are quite clear yet. I think I'm still getting inspirations as the day goes on. But it was very clear that uh, Neil may have been right two years ago three years ago now, I think, um, that a school may one day have to emerge out of this whole process of just being true to my truth or my vision about life. So if you could just make this clear for me, is this an institute that's primarily about spirituality since that's what inspired it? Or, I mean, what is the institute really geared towards teaching? Is it about spiritual concepts primarily? Um, it's not necessarily about spiritual concepts primarily. If you would go to my website or uh, if you'll read my book when it's published, it's not published yet, um, there are a lot of concepts in there that uh, don't seem to talk about spirituality at all, yet I believe that they are spiritual. Mm. Um, so it is, it is spiritual in nature primarily because everything is spirit primarily. Um, but what I am doing, my thing is to do is, uh, it's sort of a little bit of a, a deconstruction, you know, which is what the unlearned process is. You have to point out enough of the things that are not working based on what we're all trying to say we're up to. And hopefully if enough people see that, they sort of have this awakening, this sort of unlearning. And then you're free to kind of learn again. You look at the world with a whole bunch of different set of eyes mm. and the truth that comes through those observations is very different than the truth that you were fed through most of your life. So um, is it primarily spiritual? I have to say yes, but upon first look, uh, no. A lot of people, I, I, I got a, a response from uh, an email on the website and it said basically what you're kind of just talking about is semantics in one way or another, which is not really, doesn't sound too spiritual. And I had to respond to that. I said, it may very well be semantics. We might very well be doing a lot of wordplay, but you can tell a lot about a person's consciousness by the words that they use. For example, you can say God, and that can, and the way you use God in your sentences will tell me a whole lot about your spiritual beliefs and your level of consciousness than opposed to the way that I use the word God. And so uh, it is important to look at the words that we use. It is important to look at the structures that we build. It is important to look at the way that we live our lives, the outer manifestations of spirit, because they give us an inner revealing, not always accurate, but still many times so, of what spirit is really up to in each person's life. Hmm. Okay, thanks. What are some of the difficulties of the unlearning process? Uh, what are some of the difficulties of the unlearning process? I'd have to say two big things come across for me. One is um, how to decide what is true and what is not. It's sort of like being in a relationship that you trusted somebody so implicitly for so long and then you wake up one day and you realize they have been lying to you consciously for most of your life. Not lying to you by accident, but lying to you on purpose. And if you can imagine the, um, the sense of rejection, the sense of anger, the sense of frustration and bewilderment that a person would feel like in that sort of situation, um, that's kind of like what the unlearning process is like in the beginning. There's a great deal of frustration about having been lied to. We are only given so many years on this life to live and we all want to live them to the maximum quality that we can. And when you realize that a lot of your life has been based on lies, 
I guess there's an anger there that makes you realize that possibly you feel like you've wasted your life. Um, but ultimately in the spiritual, you know, you can rationalize it off, say everything happens for a reason and all that stuff. That's still not going to make the anger go away. So one, there's a great deal of anger and frustration. And so you don't know what to believe anymore. Um, so you have to really learn all over again uh, how to decide the truth. And that's a very, 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 very tough process. I, I'm still in the process of figuring that out. And um, there's a great scene in the new Matrix movie, you know, where uh, Keanu Reeves' character, Neo, comes in, in face to face with uh, this Oracle character. And he is basically at the same point, too. He's plugged himself out of the Matrix, uh, which is, has a lot of great uh, uh, synonyms or uh, similarities to what the unlearning process might be. And uh, in that situation, he himself doesn't know who to trust. And ultimately, the decision is you just have to go by your feelings. And your academic upbringing teaches you to disassociate from your feelings so much. Everything has to be reasoned and rational and logical. Left brain and your whole right brain, most of our right brain has been so shut down uh, that we don't know how to trust that intuition. We don't know because we've been given so much poor information it's how to figure out what's true and what's not is tough. So that's the first thing that's tough is how to decide what's true. And then the second thing is uh, really who to trust and what to trust. And, and ultimately, the only answer that I've come up with so far is that the only thing that I implicitly trust is myself. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that I can really do. Now, that doesn't mean I'm a loner. That doesn't mean I'm antisocial. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm a very friendly guy. I'm a very sociable person. But uh, I understand that most people don't understand the true workings of the world. Uh, and I don't understand all of the true workings of the world either. I'm not going to hear, sit here like some prophet or some guru saying that I know everything. Um, what I'm going to say is that I don't know a great deal, which puts me ahead of a huge curve of the population because most of us are out here on the planet acting like we know everything. And because we're acting like we know everything, we are stopping new information from coming into our lives. And it's that new information that if we were open to it, would change the way that we perceive the world. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a combination of those two. And if you can clear the emotions, and I think that's the, the hardest part of the unlearning process initially, for maybe the first six to eight months, maybe even longer, depending upon your psychological makeup, you are going to be unbalanced in one way or another because you realize that you're waking up to this, what potentially is, depending upon what kind of world you decide you want to live in, possibly a nightmare and nobody's getting it or very few people are getting it and you don't know what to do and you've got to try and make sense of your life. You've got to try and reinvent yourself and some people might need help with that. And so that's one of the other reasons why I kind of started the Institute of Unlearning is that when people are thrown out into that world for the first time and don't know who to trust and don't know what to do, maybe this place would be a nice place for you to stop and catch your breath and kind of figure out your bearings. Uh, how are you going to do this? Is this like with the courses that you're going to be offering online? Are these exercises? Are these lectures? Um, how does the Institute help, help one unlearn? Well, uh, it's not about me, Pat Mooney, doing it all. There are a lot of other people out there doing great, great, great work in this process as well. Uh, you know, I mean, early on, anybody in the spiritual movement, you know, Neil Donald Walsh was super, but even in everybody's own religions, like Anthony DeMello was devoutly Catholic, even though he saw his own religion as an obstacle to spirituality, he was oftentimes apologetic about Catholicism, and yet still he was very proud to be a priest. So religion, you know, uh, in your own religion, you may find some people who are always pointing figures. We call them mystics. Those are the people who are always one step ahead of the curve, and they're always trying to point people to see what they're seeing and to share their vision of life. So I'm not going to put it all on my back and say that I'm the guy, even though the title of my book is The American Messiah. And I do say that I am a messiah. But what the message is ultimately is that we are all messiahs, that uh, uh, the world has to stop uh, waiting for some superhero, some super god, some whatever, to come down and open up a can of whoop-ass 
kick all the bad guys' butts and make it easy for us for the rest of our lives. It's not going to happen unless it does. Uh, but I really don't believe that that's the case. I, I don't think that that's what evolution is. If that was the solution, if it was that easy, why didn't God do that 2,000 years ago when he was Jesus or, you know, in that kind of story? Or why didn't God just do that from the beginning? Why is he just running the clock around, letting us bite ourselves in the butt and watching us suffer here and not get it? And then ultimately he's just going to come in and say, all right, you had your fun. You couldn't do it. Now I'm going to do it and we'll all live happily ever after. To me, that's kind of sick and sadistic. It's, uh, it's like giving your two-year-old son a calculus problem and giving him five years to figure it out without teaching him any of the basics all the way up. And that would be a sick joke to play. And so I don't believe in a God like that. And I don't believe that there's a God like that at all, period. So I think that there is, a, what I'm trying to do is call people to say, it's not about me, it's about you. So a part of my job is to antagonize, to uh, poke fun, to deconstruct, to challenge, to interrogate, to question, to provoke over and over again, people to uh, want to do something for themselves. I want you to get up off your ass and start looking for these things yourselves. Because if it is me doing it, if it's just me or people like me and we're in small number, we're all going to get killed or we're all going to get shut down or ridiculed. You don't necessarily have to kill us physically. I mean, there's enough because a lot of you will do it automatically just by saying we're too far off the edge. We're too crazy. A lot of us are already killed in, in people's minds. You know, we're not taken seriously. I mean, I'm not uh, a well-known person. You know, I have a small circle that I have an influence under, but there are some who have larger circles that they're influenced under, but we're never cracking the mainstream because the mainstream won't let us in. But even if the mainstream did let us in, we've been so programmed and we've been so conditioned that our minds wouldn't let us in for quite a long time. So it's got to be up to other people. But what I, how I'm going to do it, I'm going to write books. I'm going to produce audio series like hopefully more of these, um, more specific on topics, not just rambling about me, and uh, be a public speaker, and then possibly even just branching out into some art. I mean, I'd like to hook up with some musicians and write lyrics for songs, um, create video documentaries about topics that have always interested me, and, and hope that there's a network or two that will pick it up, and if not, we'll go on public access cable. I mean, you've just got to be willing to speak to people who are going to listen, there's that old, I guess, Chinese adage, um, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm a teacher. I think I'm part. I think to some people I am a teacher, but to me, I'm always a student as well. And I'm always looking for teachers myself who are going to constantly uh, force me to keep on expanding my vision of myself and my worldview, uh, because that's the one danger of unlearning once you kind of free yourself you think you got it and then once you think you've got it you've made the mistake that everybody who hasn't unlearned has already done you've closed your mind to anything else so you have to constantly be willing to ask questions and that's all i want to do really in any form of creativity that i want to do i just want to constantly continue to provoke people to ask questions and not only about the world, not only about the outer world, but the inner world. It's ultimately the inner questions that are most important. But like I said, by looking at the outer, you can get a real good idea of what our inner level is. The two are not separated and never have been. I have had a chance to read some of your editorials that you've been writing recently, and they seem to be pretty broad ranged and they do address the outer issues that are happening in the world and you seem to be bringing a really nice perspective of the inner into these outer events. Um, would you care to talk a little bit more about the editorials you've been writing or maybe uh, how the book, that you, The American Messiah that you mentioned, how that compares to the editorials? Uh, well, the editorials are more of a uh an expansion of a lot of the concepts that I that I write about in the book. It's easier. I won't spend too much time here talking about the editorials because uh, I would just encourage you who are listening right now to go home and and start reading some of them. Chances are, if you've bought the CD, you're you're somebody who's uh, maybe in line and have read most of them already. But the editorials for me are uh, my way of putting an unlearned 
or an unlearning point of view out there in the world. So many times you turn on all the major news networks and you know, you're just going to get the prefabricated AP off the wire. Somebody read it and then everybody reads it a hundred times all across the networks. No true story, no change, no matter how much the networks try and advertise that they're different from one another, that they're fair and balanced and that they let you decide. Uh, the decision about what's going to be put on the air has been made long ago and you're being fed a very, very, very small diet. So all I'm trying to do on my editorials is put out a point of view that is not getting on the mainstream and might uh, more often than not be ridiculed by the mainstream. You know, uh, you said uh, you complimented me on some of the things that I wrote there and thank you for that. But um, a lot of the feedback that I get is is controversial, you know, everything from get off the bong uh, to what planet are you on and, you know, all those sorts of things. And uh, that's going to be a reaction that people have, too. So and I expect those reactions. Anybody who stands up for their own version of the truth, particularly if it's comp contradictory from mainstream reality, is going to um, meet that kind of ridicule. Every now and then you get some praise and that feels good. But that's not why you do it. Um, so it really doesn't matter what anybody thinks about what I'm writing. I feel good about what I'm putting out there. And it's like a bird singing its song. You know, if you're walking by and you hear the song and you like it, stop and listen. You know, maybe it'll make your day. And if you don't notice it, you don't notice it. That's I can't control who's going to listen or what the reactions of, of people are going to be are. But certainly the what I do with the editorials is... Uh, poke fun, provoke what's going on outside in order to point people right back inside. Always at the end of my editorials is the question in larger type, whose life are you living? And that was something that I started to ask my students um, a couple of years ago because so many of the uh, ideas that were fed throughout our formative years and even after our formative years are to get you to live a life to make someone else happy by conforming and plugging into the societal structure today you are ultimately making the creators and the architects of that societal structure very 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 happy and most people think the illusion is is that we have a say in the society that we're creating and once you unlearn from that you realize that you have been living somebody else's life and not your own most people have this sort of thing like i have to do this i have to do that life's a bitch and then you die, you know, all those sorts of things. And um, it's simply not true. But when you believe it's true, you are robbed of your personal power. Physically, I've proven this, you know, with students doing uh, kinesiology tests uh, in class where anybody who says they have to literally feels physically weaker than somebody who lives a life from the thought form of choosing. I choose to. When you choose to, you're taking more responsibility, you're acting from your own power, and life is therefore much more enjoyable because you're at the wheel. When you're living have to, you're living by somebody's commands, even if you don't know who they are. Somewhere down the line, they say, whoever they are, you have to do this, you have to do that. And one thing after another, we put that moniker into our relationships. I have a girlfriend, I have to do this. I have a job, I have to do this. I have kids, I have to do this. I have you know, a religion. I have to do this. And so we have, 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 have. And what we lose in all these haves is that somewhere along the line, we can say yes and no to these things at any time in our life. And we can accept responsibility whenever we're ready. So most people, even though we complain about the lives of have tos, we love it in one way or another, because ultimately when our life goes wrong, when it gets shitty, we've got someone to blame. And particularly here in the United States, we have been thriving on victim consciousness for quite a long time. Uh, life is not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. And to an extent, there is a partial truth to that. But the only way you're ever going to stop that is if you take responsibility for your life, you stop playing victim, you stop blaming others, and you start seeing how you got in the mess in the first place. And that's where it goes. So is that in some way how we become messiahs? Or I'm, I'm curious about the title of your book and what you've just said. Tell us a little bit more about the meaning of becoming or claiming our messiah-ness. Okay, I think uh, as far as 
uh, being a Messiah goes, Messiah simply means anointed. And I think just because of uh, our religious upbringing, we particularly uh, in America, which is a largely Christian uh, nation, and so therefore we've been programmed by Christianity for hundreds of years in our culture. And then if you want to go back to our European culture, it literally goes back thousands of years. We've got this Christian programming and Christian uh, Christianity is one of the most dumbed down religions in the world because uh, if you look at the medieval uh, system of structure in which a lot of these modern Christian uh, religions emerge from, Christianity was able to survive by basically destroying all the knowledge bases uh, from the other religions. Druid, Druid religion uh, was basically burned. The Gnostic uh, religions were all forced underground. A huge, the world's biggest library in Alexandria, Egypt, was destroyed uh, in the in the early first uh, millennium uh, in the modern times, and so in in those sorts of things, uh, and most people were not even allowed to read the Bible for it was against the law for quite a long time in medieval times, and so basically we've been spoon fed uh, a sort of thing, and we might we we tend to believe that Jesus is the only Messiah. But there were thousands of messiahs in his times. A messiah simply meant anointed. As a matter of fact, the word goes all, all, all the way back to uh, Egyptian culture, messiah. And so it's been a practice. It's been around. It has no special religious or savior connotation to it, except the kind that, we, that uh, Christianity has put on it. So it's hard to separate the word messiah from savior. Um, but in any case, what I'm trying to point out by saying the American messiah is... You've got to save yourself. And as a matter of fact, the whole truth of the matter is, is that you're already saved. And we're all saved because we were never in danger to begin with. The idea that we're in danger to begin with um, was once again an idea foisted on us by those who sought to control us. So by making us believe that we were imperfect, by making us believing that we were flawed and that we were sinful and that we were evil and that we needed to be controlled over and over again. Uh, we, it made it very easy for humanity over thousands of years to give up its power to quote unquote, the enlightened few masters of our society. And I think we're waking up to the fact that that's a pretty bad deal. We've given them 90% of the pie because they're so enlightened and, uh, that enlightened section is maybe 10% of the population, and that's an exaggeration. So the 90% of the population, you and I, have been fighting over 10% of the pie, and so we're supposed to believe that because we can't share that 10% of the pie equitably, uh, and we have to fight and kill and scrounge for that, that we are evil. But let me tell you this, if you expand that pie, and you take that 90% of the pie away from the 10% that have been hoarding it for all this time, a lot of the ideas about humans being evil and uncontrollable, I believe would go right by the wayside. So what I'm trying to basically say is you're saved already. The only problem is, is that there's been a group of bullies, uh, you know, in the corner of the room who've been hoarding all the party goods. And if we can just uh, walk over to them kindly and politely uh, and ask them to move, many of them will, if a lot of people wake up, if a few people wake up, the bullies can always beat up the few people. We've seen that in the schoolyards growing up all the time. The bullies exist because nobody stands up to them. But when you stand up to a bully and you've got your friends to stand up behind you, you really don't need to fight. Once bullies realize, bullies are more afraid than anybody else. So this whole system has been based on fear. As much as we are afraid of each other, they are more afraid of us. But we've been led to be afraid of each other and forget about the bullies that are running the ground. So my whole thing about the American Messiah is to just get people to not be afraid of their own power. What does your documentary video on John of God, the Brazilian healer, have to do with unlearning? Um, John of God is an interesting story. Um, I was alerted about him by a very good friend of mine and decided to take a trip down to Brazil to see for myself. John of God is a man who for, geez, 44 years of his life, I think he's started at 16, um, started to have some bizarre ex 
experiences, and he's 60 now, so it's about 44 years, where uh, apparently he gets taken over by these dead doctors. So it's a kind of uh, psychic experience, a medium experience, and uh, he's got no formal schooling. He dropped out second grade, so not very smart. Certainly has no medical training, that's for sure. And yet uh, books have been written about this guy, about the amazing cures that this guy's done. He operates on people with surgical instruments without using anesthesia. Um, lots of things. He operates on people without even touching them. And so when I heard this, I just said, well, if this man is half as true as the books I've read about him, uh, describe him, this would be an excellent documentary to let people know about. And, and so how does he connect to the unlearning process is uh, most people in America are getting wind anyway, uh, that modern allopathic medicine, your doctors, surgeries and prescription drugs are not the healthiest way to heal many of the illnesses that creep up in our lives. And a lot of us are into preventative medicine. Uh, we're more into alternative medicines that are uh, more in balance with the energies of the body that don't necessarily want to cut it, invade it, destroy it, um, soak it in chemicals um, in order to get rid of symptoms and not necessarily cure illnesses. Most people are interested in curing illnesses and we want to attack that. So. Uh, I simply put it out there as uh, if there is something to what this man is doing, re receiving, which is receiving um, very skilled medical information from the other side or the other side of the veil, whether it's death or another vibration, that's your own opinion. Um, but if, if there's something that we can learn from that, uh, let's, let's look at it. And to me, the exciting thing about it is, is that it's not technologically based at all. We're so, particularly here in America and, and also in the industrialized worlds, we're always looking for the cutting edge technology. And what we keep failing to remember is that the most cutting edge technology in the universe is the human body. It's a machine designed like no other machine. And I believe that people like John of God find a way to tap into the hidden potential of human technology, human body technology, and simply studying him and not being afraid of what's going on. We may learn a whole lot about self-healing that we might not need any of that. But obviously, too, uh, his kind of healing poses a great deal of threat to the medical establishment and the pharmaceutical industry, which is... Uh, which is why I felt compelled to make the documentary about it. Here in America, we spend the most for any nation on health, and yet we do not rank among the best in healthcare. The same thing goes with technology and education. Things are getting more and more costly and more and more cost prohibitive to the, to the average working man uh, in here. And we're not getting what we're paying for. We're not getting the solutions. And my thing as an unlearner, is I believe that the answer is not in technology. The answer is in spirituality. The answer is in uh, healthy, energetic, psychic concepts that the human body has been technologically hardwired for for quite a long time. And so people like John of God may just give us a hint at um, what those capabilities might be, whether you believe in dead spirits or anybody has medium abilities or not. I don't necessarily believe in them, and I, I'm not necessarily sure that uh, the people he's working with are dead doctors. Could be aliens for all I know. Could be some sort of psychic energy that we don't know. It might be just simply the placebo effect. But if it's the placebo effect, it's a mighty powerful placebo effect. And hell, I'm all for studying that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are interested in studying for that. But once again, you're not going to get that kind of information on the mainstream news media networks who are oftentimes in cahoots with the medical and pharmaceutical establishment. So they're not gonna put out information that's contradictory, that's not gonna rake in advertising dollars. This guy heals people for no money, no money, and he's been doing it all that time. He survives on donations, but he doesn't even ask for donations. It's just a box and you gotta put it out there. And he's not thriving, he's surviving. He's not living in the lap of luxury or anything like that. But for the poor people in Brazil, and Brazil is a very poor country, he's the only healthcare, the only real healthcare that a lot of those people are ever gonna get.
And I think it's a great story, and I think a lot of people would be interested in hearing about that story. And I think when you tell stories like that, it encourages other people who may have that same gift in other places around the world to come out of the woodwork. So it doesn't have to once again be John of God. You don't have to go down and fly down to Brazil to get your healing or to learn something. You don't have to go to the Institute of Unlearning to get your to get your fill. Uh, on my website, I, I link a lot of uh, a lot of other people you know, that I think are part of the unlearning process, that are doing great work as far as uh, putting out alternative ideas uh, to the world. And it's just about opening up your mind to more than what you learned in science class, more than what you learned in history class, more than what you learned in your church, more than even probably what you learned in your parents. Now, we've all been teaching this stuff, most of us anyway, with love, but we've also been doing it in ignorance. And the more we're able to open up, the more we're able to do it. But you open yourself up to a lot of risks because most people want safe. You know, we want security. We want insurance on things. And spirituality, life is a messy affair. So, you know, this John of God might be a total crackpot, but watch the video mm -hmm. and find out, you know. Conspiracy theory might be a whole lot of bullshit. But you know what? Read it yourself instead of telling you Instead of listening to somebody tell you what that book's about, read the book yourself and let your mind start to put the pieces together. Most people won't even open the book. Most people won't even take the trip to Brazil. Most people won't even watch the video. Most people won't even go you know, to the corner bookstore to pick up a book that might change their life. Uh, instead, we want to sit in front of the television and, and snoop on what other people's lives are about. And we've got to be able to change that about ourselves. And so once again, this is just another tool to provoke people, hey, you know, there's a whole world out there that I might be missing. I never heard of this guy at all. And maybe there's somebody in my neck of the woods that's kind of like that the same way. So open your eyes, open your ears, most importantly, open your heart and see what spirit has been trying to tell you. Because the news media can put their message out, but even through that media, through that controlled source of information, spirit can get through. There's not any place where spirit can't break through if you're willing to listen. So that's the ultimate thing. It's just another thing. Hey, listen, something interesting is going on in this life, mm -hmm. in this planet at this time. Mm -hmm. Well, this documentary sounds like it's giving viewers an opportunity to really see something about true human potential that we often don't get to see or experience in reality, the way it's structured and uh, created for us. So we can find this on your website? Uh, you can find uh, information about the documentary. Viewers <laughs> haven't been able to access it yet because uh, like anything, it's part of the unlearning process. I'm, I'm kind of reinventing myself and, and having to learn, you know, all over again how to do things. And one of the things I'm learning how to do is to, is to edit uh, and produce a, a video. So. Mm. Um, that is part of my project, and I do hope to have it released by the end of this year. So towards the fall, late fall, um, keep looking at that. And in the meantime, um, check back with the website, and uh, I'll give you updates from time to time about how that's going and ways that you want to help if you want to do that too. Okay, well, since you've mentioned the website, would you mind telling us a little bit more about um, what's on that website and what can we expect if we check into unlearning.org. Uh, the main thing that I want to do with the website is once again promote uh, in a very forceful way what I believe the unlearning concept is, uh, what I believe the unlearning process is. So it's meant to promote me as a speaker um, about that. It's meant to promote me as an author uh, through the American Messiah and through my editorials. Um, that I have a message about this to get that out there. It's meant to promote uh, different ideas um, through the documentary um, and through other artistic or creative projects that I may decide to create throughout this whole process. Uh, what's on the website now is not a, is not a final product. It's, a, it's an evolutionary product. It will always be changing. Uh, and, it's, and it's really still very much in its infancy stages. It's, it went online on April 18th, and here we are a month later, literally, you know, talking about it. And uh, I've been very uh, happy with uh, the first month 
but I realized that this is going to take a lot of work. So I think um, what I would ask people of the website is, is to be patient, but also to be encouraging to, to, um, and to not just support me. It, it, once again, too, in the links page, uh, I have about 20 sites up there that I think are also important. Uh, for people to look at. So um, even though I I put up a donations page and I would like people to support me and uh, uh, be nice to get jobs as a speaker and all that, I would be very happy if um, I was just enlightening people by pointing them to a site that jived more with them. Um, but I feel like as times go on, uh, I would like to run retreats. I would like to evolve into that. Um, there's a whole host of things and, and I'm open to suggestions too. I think the final thing, the, the final reason why I put a website out there is that I'm looking for partners. I'm looking for people who are understanding my vibe, understanding what unlearning is all about and want to help and they want to link and they want to do something and they don't kind of know what. So if you're out there and you're hearing this and you want to get involved and you know other people that want to get involved and you want to make something happen, let's get together let's put ourselves in a room and let's talk you know how do we how do we let other people know about this how do we unlearn ourselves maybe you're just curious about it and you don't know how to unlearn and you want to talk about that um or you want to get together and you want to talk about the big problems you know what do we do about politics what do we do about this war on terror what do we do about this uh uh environmental crisis what do we do about the uh the economic systems in the world that are that are largely tools for wealth confiscation and 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 uh, and financial imprisonment for most of the world. You know the suppression of humanity uh, based simply on credit and banking practices. You know how do we liberate ourselves from that? There's a whole bunch of uh, ways that unlearning can be very powerful for a lot of people. It's not going to be one thing for everybody, but it's sort of like a call to see who else is out there and and who wants to work. So. I'm working. That's what the website lets the world know. I'm working. And uh, as my good friend in Georgia would say, who's with me? Mm. Come on. Who's with me? <laughs> what has your, your own unlearning process been like? Can you tell us a little bit about the personal experiences? Uh, sure. I love to say this in the beginning, just to give you uh, an idea in the current political climate, just how powerful the unlearning process could be. Um, I voted for George Bush for president. And <clears throat> here I am today uh, writing that this man is a criminal. Um, and I'm not sorry that I voted for him because I believe that Gore would have been uh, would have done the same things and we would still be fighting this war on terror. September 11th would have happened and all those sorts of things had he been elected too. Uh, if anything, what I learned through the whole process is, is that voting in America is a ridiculous concept because uh, democracy is an illusion and most Americans are not willing to see that because we believe that this war on terror and everything else, uh, all this other stuff is about freedom and democracy and People in Europe who are listening to this might believe that they live in a free and democratic country as well. You may live in a more open society than we do currently here in America, but the illusion is just as strong over there too. The same moneyed powers that are in control over here are the same moneyed powers that are in control over there. It's just, uh, you know, which way do you like your consciousness to be suppressed? You know, different strokes for different folks. But the bottom line is people's consciousness is being suppressed worldwide. And there's a, there's a power structure that is responsible for that. And so for me, the unlearning process was, uh, I mean, I was a conservative, Catholic, working class American, Republican, fully believed in the American way of life, fully believed in freedom and democracy. Even after September 11th, I didn't agree with the war in Afghanistan or this war on terror. But I believe that people were angry with the American way of life, yet I still believed in the American way of life. And so me being there as a teacher in front of my students really made me ask those questions. And being a history teacher on top of the line, too, I don't know how it happened, uh, but it just started to become very, very aware that the history that I was teaching was propaganda. It was a lie. It's meant to get students to plug into the American way of life 
and the American way of life is brutal, to say the least. You know, it's been brutal on the world, and there's a lot of anger out there, and most Americans don't see that because the media shields us from the effects of our actions in other world, in, in other places around the world. And so for me, the unlearning process was really, really, really drastic. Because one, I believed in the system. I was, you know, vote, participate, you know, uh, debated in my life for the most part to, uh, to be a leader uh, in politics, to be a Democrat or a Republican or whatever, one way or the other, um, or to lead some grassroots political movement um, to the point where now I see that that's a waste of time. In a spiritual sense, I was devoutly Catholic. I had battled with the idea of being a priest for quite a bit, lived with a religious order for a year, um, was really devout to that as well, and was about to settle down and get married and have that good Catholic life. And all that went by the wayside too. Um, I had a very wonderful job as a teacher in high school, very successful, very popular, loved my job, loved the lifestyle. But the unlearning process just wrecked all of that. It wrecked my religious faith. It wrecked my political philosophy. It wrecked my economic uh, stature. Yet, with all those things being destroyed, the one thing that stood as all those things crumbled was my sense of self. And that was a great gift. All of those things had to be destroyed for me to see who I really was for the first time. And I'm still learning about who that person is. And I love that person. And I, you know, I even loved him when he was caught up in the system. But let's just say I love him even more because that person's growing up. It's shedding a lot of the crutches that he hid behind in order to define himself. And so who I am now is a person who's standing here naked in front of the world and willing to say that who I am is a constantly changing thing. On my business card for a little while, I had this funny business card. I had uh, my name, Patrick Mooney, and uh, underneath it I had the phrase human becoming. Not human being, but human becoming. So what that means is that I, I acknowledge that who I am is an eternal and ever-changing process. And so just when you think you got yourself figured out, bam, life comes around, gives you a different experience, and you have to totally rethink yourself again. I think what it's done now, though, it's made me a lot less afraid of change, where those who have not unlearned yet fear change like their own death because it is a death i died i died that pat mooney that i was just post september 11th 2001 is a dead man dead man i walked away from my job i walked away from where i live um, lost a lot of my friends you know who just simply uh, would not could not understand where i was you lose language you lose language you you uh, you lose culture, you know, not just politics, you lose culture. Like American culture doesn't make sense to me anymore. I'm not interested in American culture. I'm not interested in European culture. What I'm interested in is a human culture. What I'm interested in is a human philosophy. What I'm interested in is a human politics, a human science. And we haven't even begun to talk about those things yet. And so that's one of the main concepts that I really feel strongly about. When I was in... Uh, 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 school going all the way up the, the ranks, particularly in Catholic uh, high school and university, the concept of social justice was very, very strong and impressed in your mind. But I'm at the point where I even want to push away from the concept of social justice because I don't want to define justice in terms of a society's view of justice. That's just another cultural judgment. I want it from a human point of view. I want human justice. What is good for all of us, not just us in America, not just all of us in Europe, not just all of us in China or Africa or Israel or the Middle East. What is human justice? And when we start looking at terms like that, like I said, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. So I'm looking for human thinkers and I'm human and I'm really trying to just figure out what human is. And you know what? I'm even willing 
to postulate that I might not even be human in some sense as we understand the term. So even though I'll call myself human now, I reserve the right to change my mind in the future. And I think that's the big thing about unlearning. You always have to have it in your pocket that you reserve the right to change your mind because the world is going to try and box you in. You know, some people might even say this, you know, listening to this interview, oh, this guy's this or this guy's that. You can box me in if you want. If that makes you feel comfortable, go ahead and do it. But I'm not going to box you in and I'm not going to box uh, the world in because there are things that I'm, you know, even about the, the things that I left behind, there may be some things in them that I may come back and pick up later on that I may rediscover, oh, that mm -hmm. I didn't really need to throw all that stuff away. I can plug myself back into it. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to have that right. You have to have that flexibility. Unlearning certainly did that. So because it gave me faith in myself, strength in myself, um, I'm not afraid to make mistakes. I'm not afraid to challenge people. I'm not afraid to challenge ideas. And that's what I'm going to do until I get a different experience that tells me to do something differently. So that's, that's the process of a very, very radical shift. Um, my poor mother and father are probably rolling over in their graves, but, um, I think I had a chance to, a lot of this was happening while my mother was still alive and, uh, and she had a chance to kind of walk through me with some of it. She didn't, uh, she didn't understand me at all, but the great gift that she had for me was that she trusted me. Mm -hmm. She knew that she couldn't stop me anyway. And so she just kind of supported me and tried to understand me where she could. And I think that's probably the best thing that anybody listening that you could ask other people to do if you're in the process of unlearning yourself, not to agree with you, not to find validation for you, but just to trust you and to just be there for you. And you do the same thing. If you know somebody in your life and you're like, whoa, man, they're really off the deep end. You know, I mean, trust your intuition there. There's a there's a psychological imbalance that you may want to watch for. But if somebody's really just trying to understand their place in the universe and wrestling with these existential questions, just support them and let them know that you trust them and let them walk. For God's sakes, let them walk their road. Let them make their mistakes. Stop trying to protect them. Stop trying to shield them because it's those experiences that are going to give you the fruit and the richness of life for the self-reflection that you need to get the answers that you want. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's done for me. It's been, uh, it's been amazing. It's been scary. Um, but you know what? Uh, coming out of it, if I am out of it, you know, are we ever out of it? Um, I would gladly jump into the process over and over and over again because I can see really what it's doing and it's just evolving the spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what we're all here for. I mean, ultimately, I believe that we are human beings, we are spirits having a human experience and not humans trying to have a spiritual experience. I heard somebody say that somewhere down the line and it's one of the most profound things I've ever heard. We keep forgetting who we are and who we are is spirit. The flesh is the flesh and it's going to go away at some point, even if you believe in physical or immortality and you wanna stick around for you know, 300, 500, 700, thousands of years, whatever, if you're a sequential alien, you know, and you live your life, you know, all over the place and you've been the galaxies and time traveled at some point, somewhere down the line, you're going to have to let go of it. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to let go of it. So um, the flesh is ultimately, no matter how long it lasts, not who you are. You are the source, the intentionality that formed that flesh. And if we as human beings can learn that, I think that's what I mean by human point of view. What do we mean when we say... I want that innate impulse of who I am to be the ordering principle of my life and not somebody's control paradigm ordering my life. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what the unlearning process can do. And like I said, if you're, not, if you're not ready for it, don't go to my website. If you're not ready mm -hmm. for it, don't read a book. If you're not ready for it, keep watching all the crap that's on television and keep listening to the news media and you'll be fine because they have put you to bed a long time ago and they've been singing you lullabies and they're more than happy to keep doing that for as long as you live. As long as you keep providing them with the energy and the sustenance that they need to keep you in control. So sleep away if you want to.
Thank you. I really like what you said about、uh, the support during change. You know, that's one of the things that I see about your website because、um, I think most of us know that facing chaos, facing things, as you said, crumbling, perhaps our lives, our jobs, our relationships, because we have a new view, can also be very scary. And some of us will actually not go through the process because it's a little bit too threatening. We don't know what it's going to look like on the other side.、Um, there isn't enough trust in the process. But I think your website being available is a wonderful support resource. And、uh, hearing your experiences about what it was like for you is really pretty encouraging. So, any last bits on what's the real Benny here? What's the real benefit in going through a process that? Can be chaotic and life changing, and you know, that crumbling.、Uh, the real benefit is, I believe, is that when my days are done here,、um, like a well digested meal, I will be satisfied. I think the biggest fear. That most of us have about life is missing the boat,、mm. not doing the thing that we felt like we could have done if given the right break, if I decided to do this, if I didn't make that mistake, if I got this girl, if, 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 if. And so we talk ourselves out of following our dreams, and this happens all the way through childhood. All the way through your teen years, all the way through your adult life, we don't live the careers that we want to do. We certainly don't live in the world that we want to. We just want to be happy in this world. And if you look around, most people are not happy.、Um, there is misery and there is suffering abounded. And all of the religions, at one point or another, supposedly were created to find a way to alleviate the suffering. And what I'm saying is, is that after thousands of years of these religions, we still got suffering. So, to me, not only do the religions need to get thrown out, and do we need to start thinking about what religions do and what we need to do, but we need to really get down to what is happiness. And happiness is basically you taking control of your life and living it according to your terms. We love those rebels. You know, we love them and hate them at the same time. You know, we celebrate the Jimmy Deans and the Frank Sinatras. They're so cool. They do it their way.、Um, and yet, at the same time, when somebody tries to be a rebel, we're the first ones to kind of slap them down and say, Who do you think you are? Get back in line. And that's a huge, huge, huge contradiction. So, we secretly root for the rebels and at the same time, while publicly trying to look like everybody else. And the secretly rooting for the rebels, that's your spirit. That's your true choice talking. You know, that's you being.、Mm. An individual, that's your heart that wants to go. The conformity is your mind. The conformity is you、uh, plugging into somebody else's paradigm because it feels safe and candy coated and sugar coated and all those sorts of things. But guaranteed, you will be happier following the rebel road, following your own road. And it's、uh, sort of like that line in Braveheart, even though Braveheart was a huge movie of political propaganda. Um, I still felt like it had a, a good message in it. And it was a, if you look at it as a piece of fiction, it's a wonderful movie.、Um, but as truth, it's far off from, from what really happened、uh, in the time. But there's a great line in Braveheart that says, Every man dies, but not every man truly lives. You know?、mm. And it's just that that's really what I would say is live the life that you want to live and don't give a rat's ass. As my dad used to say,、mm -hmm. don't give a rat's ass or a flying fuck、mm -hmm. about what anybody else would think.、Mm -hmm. Because at the end of your life, they'll still be bitching and moaning while you are laying down for your final time before you close your eyes and saying, I did it my way and I feel good.、Mm -hmm. You know, instead of, I should have d i d it my way, I wish I had another chance.、Mm -hmm. Because, you know, no matter what you believe about one side or another, you may not get that chance again. You certainly, may, you certainly won't get the chance in this skin that you're in right now. You may get the chance in some other skin if you believe in reincarnation and all that stuff, but you're not going to get the chance in this skin. So, what are you waiting for? The worst thing you're going to do is make somebody upset. So, what?
That's their problem. That's not yours. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at it that way, um, it's, it's an unnervy thing, but you know, ultimately you're satisfied mm -hmm. and that's the thing. Satisfaction. We want satisfaction. And so what I used to tell my kids is that it's a Mooney back guarantee that if you live your life according to your will, you're going to be satisfied. You know, and like, I know I can hear the fundamentalists, the religious fundamentalists getting scared already. Uh, 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 it's not your will. It's supposed to be God's will. <clears throat> you know, that's what Jesus said in the garden of Gethsemane. <clears throat> not my will, father, but your will. And while those things are uh, certainly biblically correct, um, one of the things that we keep forgetting in religion is that God is in man. So when you're saying my will be done or your will be done, who's the you that you're talking about? That you is ultimately inside of you. So think about that, reflect on that, and live the life that you want to live. Otherwise, unless your life, unless your life is to live uh, frustration and failure, if that's what you're here for, if you want to live a life of frustration and failure, do what everybody else says. You're on the right track. <laughs> you're going to be happy. You're going to say, boy, that was the most frustrating life I ever lived. That was great. Man, let's do that again. Okay, if that's what you're up to, you want to live the frustrating life, do what somebody else wants you to do. You want to live the satisfying life where you can put this life down and say, man, that was great, like a good book, put it away and it's always with you. Live life according mm -hmm. to your rules, according to your whims, according to your desires. Spirit will not lead you in any place that you can't handle or in any place that does not have grace for you, mm -hmm. food for you, life for you, richness for you, abundance for you. I'd like to take these last few moments we have together to express my gratitude to you for watching this video. Chances are, if you came across a copy of this DVD, it's because you're a supporter of the Institute of Unlearning or curious as to what an unlearned life might look like. In either case, I'd like to emphasize the point I made at the beginning and throughout this video. And that point is, is that my story is a story about power, your power. Two years ago, I started the IOU because I wanted to share with the world the visions and truths that were radically shaping my life. I was so moved by these truths that I abandoned a successful high school teaching career to promote these visions to the world at large. Since that time, the Institute of Unlearning has connected with thousands of people all over the globe, just like you, who are hungry for peace and committed to living lives of creativity and abundance in a world so far that has only known conflict and scarcity. All this has happened because I took the chance to speak my truth, and I only hope my body of work will inspire you to do the same. I want you to know that I remain committed to the vision of an empowered humanity, and I'm still working hard to get that message to a larger audience. Some of my projects are taking longer than I originally planned, but I trust now more than ever the great cycles of time and synchronicity that govern each of our lives. My deal with the universe is simply this. I speak my truth, and it finds a way to get that truth to the people that need to hear it. If you feel compelled to be a part of that, then please spread the word about the Institute of Unlearning or contact me to share your ideas as to how you would like to get involved. So thank you once again for your patience, support, encouragement, and love. The power of unlearning is not measured by how many people believe in it, but only by the passion and conviction in which you decide to live it. Until next time, whether it be on the net, in a video, or in the flesh, happy unlearning. The decision about what's going to be put on the air has been made long ago, and you're being fed a very, very, very small diet. I'm sure you're all aware of the extremely grave potential for cultural shock and social disorientation contained in this present situation. If the facts were prematurely and suddenly made public without adequate preparation and conditioning. Have you any idea how much longer this cover story will have to be maintained? Most of us are out here on the planet acting like we know everything. 
And because we're acting like we know everything, we are stopping new information from coming into our lives. And it's that new information that if we were open to it, would change the way that we perceive the world. Nobody's getting in, or very few people are getting in. And 